walk the last mile of the way, do we? <laughs> All right. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'll give everyone a, a few moments to uh, to get settled in, and then ask our ushers if they would uh, come on forward. We do appreciate you being with us tonight. Um, tell you what, closing in the section like this made us look more full, and uh, but you look good tonight. Um, we're going to pray, and then I'll make a few announcements. Uh, do you have a special prayer need you just like to let, let known by just lifting your hand? Okay. Is there any that you feel like that you would like to just say, hey, look, Brother J.D., I need, yes. Darlena. Darlena, we need to pray for Darlena. Um, and, and with that being said, praise report. I talked to Sister Joanne Lawyer, and even though she's having to have chemotherapy, she's sounding strong. Her spirits are up. She's very optimistic. It's amazing. Uh, we need to pray continually for Sister Annie because she's trying to adjust. Uh, she hardly even took an aspirin. Um, and uh, now she's on like three or four different medications. To help with the heart attack, she, they installed a stent, so probably giving her a medication to tell her body, hey, you don't want to reject this. And she's got, she's on Lasix and different things, and son, I, I'm just feeling a little weak today. That's what I heard, so we need to pray for her. And I think we can give her a little bit of, just a little bit of room, don't you think? Being 91, uh, she can be uh, given just a little bit of space. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Okay. The needs is our time to stay forward and see if we need prayer and so Okay. Niece and nephew needing prayer because of cancer. So let's pray for this. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we great, we're grateful that you've given us this opportunity to glorify your precious holy name. Father God, to praise you, to exalt you, Lord, to uh, open your word and allow it to speak to us. So God, as we go through your scriptures tonight, as we learn from your holy word, would you stir our hearts, God, give us, Lord, challenge us, Father, convict us of parts of us that are not like you, then give us the courage to be able to make the changes we need to make to be holy and acceptable before you. Lord, bless and touch all these special prayer needs, Lord, that were mentioned. We desperately need your touch tonight. Every one of these special needs, Lord, I pray that you would move. And God, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would bless this offering and those that are sowing into your kingdom, Lord, that their seed would grow up into a great harvest. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you worship with your giving? Uh, just a real quick, uh, we're going to have uh, Reverend Mike and Jamil Mills with us Sunday morning. Um, they're they're going to bring their equipment, tap into our sound system. They're going to do the music, the worship. They're going to do the preaching. And y'all just pray and come geared up and ready to worship with them. Uh, Tammy and I are still uh, on the... Um, the Winterfest Committee for the Florida Region Sunfest. And so tonight after church, we're going to leave. I've got a 12 o'clock lunch meeting tomorrow. So we're going to drive through the night and I'm going to try to make it to that meeting. Just pray for us to have safety and protection. Um, uh, Pastor Dan will be with us Sunday morning helping us moderate and, and hosting our guest. And so uh, tell everyone that you know that we, we got a special service on Sunday morning, if you would. Uh, invite about 55 people each and, and bring them to church to be a part of that. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. Uh, getting into our, our lesson tonight, uh, Sister Ellen ended, I believe, on page 87 at C4. And so I'm planning on starting, we're in chapter 5, page 87 at C5, and we're going to be talking about works in the self-indulgence realm. Works in the self-indulgence realm. Uh, Sister Ellen can attest to this, and those of you who have the book, if you, if you got the book, and I believe, Sister Chris, I've got a book for you that was set aside. Somebody said that you had requested a book, and I'd set it aside, and then... 
we change. So I apologize. I need to get that to you. Um, so uh, works in the self-indulgence realm at, at C5. And so as we began to talk about that, the second of these works, uh, according to the scriptures, um, and I believe we're studying is Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21. It talks about revelings. And the word for revelings is K-O-M-O-S, comos. When I first looked at it, at first glanced, it was cosmos. Um, uh, I know what I was going to say before I got that. Forgive me. I'm getting there. Not a word, Miss Sonia. Is the gentleman who wrote this, he wrote this, these books college level. And we have to read and reread and highlight and take notes and go back and pray and fast 40 days and nights to pull this material out because it is some very good, but it's in depth the way, the way that he writes. Okay. Um, the second of these works is revelings. Uh, K-O-M-O-S, comos which comes from another word that means to lie outstretched. And this scenario came to me as I was studying this part of the lesson. Do you remember the story where um, uh, the, uh, the girlfriend of Herod's daughter come and dance before Herod? And it mesmerized him so much. He said, look, I'll give you anything you want up to half of the kingdom. She said, well, I want John the Baptist's head. Um, well, I, I've seen movies that, that portrayed that. And there was like a, a porch area or a, a common area with, with big pillows, throw pillows. And all of these ritzy, rich people were lounging back, laid back. Uh, it's the, the scenario where the person sitting there dropping the grapes in the mouth kind of thing, but they're laid all back. So get this image in your head um, about this comos word, this revelings word, to lie outstretched, okay? The Romans of Paul's day enjoyed several days of feasting and drinking. And this was drinking as in getting drunk drinking, okay? While often lying outstretched on these cushions. So the reveler might well be in a similar position. This word comos also carries with a meaning of carousing or a carousal, uh, rioting, but not rioting like in a street um, for uh, racial tension or, thing, or tearing down statues or anything like that, but more so in a sense of, look, we're just having this big party. We're just throwing a party um, like you see at the end of a NASCAR race or somebody and they shake up the champagne and they're spraying everybody down. That kind of uh, setting. Another uh, phrase for this is just letting loose. Losing all sense of yourself and just letting loose. Being uh, redonkulous. Let's just put it that way. That's what this word means. Whereas the spirit man, we've, we've studied this girds up the loins of his mind. The spirit man girds up the loins of his mind, but the fleshly man hungers after comos, letting loose. We gird up the loins of our mind if we want to be spiritually minded, but the fleshy man Comos uh, lets loose with all boisterousness and obscene activities. Uh, my wife, Tammy, was sharing this story that she went to a Baptist church school and there was a situation where some kids found themselves in a similar carousing type situation to where they began to party and mess around and, and drink. And before they know it, it's the next morning. The young lady wakes up. She had been with four young men. They were all knocked out from their drinking. She had to have all of them tested to find out who the baby was. That's carousing. That's, that right there is what this is saying. That, that puts it in perspective. See, we're talking about pulling down the rebellion of the flesh. Pulling down the rebellion of the flesh. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I believe if I went and I pinched you, it would hurt. You'd probably slap me for pinching you. Because you're human, just like I'm human. But there's times I can be running and listening to worship music. And something will come to my mind that 
I should not think. And I have to kick that out of my mind. Now, if you're human like I am, you have those thoughts too. Uh, it may be as simple as wanting to slap somebody silly because of their foolishness. It may be an evil thought that you, you should not have thought at all. Or, or flipping through the channels and come by a commercial that's inappropriate, um, but it catches the eye and you stop to look. The flesh will, hey, look, you want to see what that's all about. Our flesh, our, our fleshy mind wants to um, view, wants to uh, be a part of that, not spiritual mindedness. So we're talking about pulling down the rebellion of the flesh. The flesh nature is always locked in a civil war of rebellion against the Spirit of God and against a believer's desire to live for Christ. I can't tell you that the longer I live for Jesus that it, it's easier to live for the Lord. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, we wrestle against flesh and blood. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against carnality. We're wrestling, we talked about it earlier in this study, the, the attitude of the world. We're wrestling against the attacks of the enemy on our mind. But there is there is an answer. There is a defensive strategy. I, I wrote myself a little note just to throw this out there. There's a two-part defensive strategy, and we're going to get into this. So if you want to write this down somewhere on your piece of paper, we're going to still go through these because we've got these slides we want to talk about. But one is submit to God. And under submitting to God, we're going to talk about following Jesus' model. And the second one is submitting to the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Those are two things we're getting ready to talk about. So we're, we're discussing now a two-part defensive strategy. One, submitting to God, and the other one, submitting to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the submitting to God, uh, according to our study here, is following the Jesus model. Then submitting to the Holy Spirit is walking in the Spirit. So let's get into that. The best defensive strategy for preventing the flesh nature from ruling us is to uh, first submit Submit ourselves to God and the Holy Spirit. First, submit ourselves to God and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is our perfect model for doing that. Um, the, the notes say that though he was 100%, he was fully God, he was also 100% fully man. If he was hungry, he had to get something to eat. He perspired. The Bible lets us know his sweat came as great drops of blood. And there were times he grew physically tired. We find him asleep in the back of the boat when the storm came up with the disciples. So Jesus experienced what we experience in our bodies. He received all sor sorts of external stimuli through the senses of touch. He stopped when the woman with the issue of blood grabbed the hem of his garment. Somebody has touched me. Jesus experienced the sense of touch, the sense of taste hanging on the cross. They stuck that sponge in his mouth with the gall in it. So we see that in the scriptures. Uh, hearing the people that would cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, there were times that uh, he he experienced smelling and sight. Furthermore, Hebrews 4.15, let's move beyond just the, the, the five senses. Let's move beyond the, his humanity of being hungry and perspiring and growing physically tired. Hebrews 4.15 tells us he was tempted in all points like we are. Can you imagine that? That, that Jesus, the one man, the Son of Man, the Son of God, 100% God, 100% man, in some form or another, was tempted in all the temptations that you and I will ever face. Jesus was. That's amazing to me. But we find he was tempted in all points like as we are, but the rest of that scripture says, yet he did not sin. Which lets me know if we'll walk in the Spirit and submit to God, you and I can, can keep from sinning. Peter, in, in, I believe it's 1 Peter, talks about this list of add to your faith, knowledge, and to your knowledge, uh, love. And it's this long list. And at the end, he said, and if you do these things, you will 
never fall. The thing that I struggle with is I don't always do these things. There's times I yield to my flesh, man, and I do things and say things that are unholy, and I shouldn't do it. That's why it's important for us to, us to understand we're not saved by our works. Our works display that we are saved. But we are saved by grace and we put our faith in the God man, the son of man, the son of God, Jesus, who was tempted in everything we face. But he didn't give in. He stood strong and he showed us the way. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talks about compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Um, we run this race laying aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he showed us the way and how we are ought to live. Uh, through it all, our Lord never sinned in any point or transgressed the holiness of God in any way. Undoubtedly, he struggled with human weakness, and yet he was sinlessly uh, victorious. We studied the temptation in the wilderness, and at the end of the 40 days, the Bible says he hungered. Anyone ever experienced when our, our pastor in the past had called a 21 day of prayer and fasting? You get about halfway through day one and you feel like you're about to die. Anybody like that? Uh, yeah. Uh, and maybe if we can offset the food somewhere around day two or three, we get a caffeine headache that won't quit. We start craving any form of coffee we can get. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, because our body is saying, you want some more of that. Well, no, I committed to God. No, you want some more. You want to give in to that. Jesus didn't give in. He was sinlessly victorious. Continue with the thought of putting down the rebellion of the flesh, following Jesus' model. If believers are going to be victorious over our own selves... Then we must, Philippians 2, 5, let the mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. We must follow the Jesus model. That's what it means to be a Christian, Christ-like. We are to follow his example. Um, when he uh, participated in communion uh, with his disciples in the Last Supper, Jesus left the thought with them that after this time with you, I'm not going to eat or drink from the vine till I do it with you in my Father's kingdom in the end time. You remember him saying that. But he encouraged them, now you all continue. Do this in remembrance of me from this point forward. When he washed his disciples' feet and when he completed it, he dried his hands. He says, now I want you to do to one another as I have done to you. It is, let the mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to follow his example. My biggest problem right now is me. If I can get me straightened out, I, I, I've, I've won a great victory to get me straightened out. Um, our pastor shared the story once of the, the, the senior lady in a church, and it might have been at Lakedale. I can't remember where it was, but she had told the pastor, Pastor, I tell you what, I just praise God. I have never sinned. And he was like, oh, Lord, let me step over here because some lightning strikes me again. <clears throat> Did that come out of my mouth? James 4, 6b in number, verse 7 says, uh, it tells us to give a, a spiritual warfare strategy uh, that we see gloriously demonstrated in the life uh, of Jesus. This is what it says. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Is submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But there is a submission to God then a resisting of the devil. Let's go back to Philippians 2 and look at what he said in verse 7 and 8. We just read verse 5, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. But then verse 7 and 8 says, but he made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Now I've heard someone say this before. Jesus isn't asking us to die for him. He's asking us to live for him, and we struggle with just living for him. 
uh, you know, I remember seeing as I was growing up these, uh, the first time I saw this movie, I think it was called A Thief in the Night, and it was on a reel-to-reel -reel for those of us who could remember the reel-to-reel, -reel. and it scared me to pieces, man, the end of times and the rapture taking place and the girl got left and all these movies, it, 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 shook, it shook me up. It, it got me into order. I was repenting of things I didn't even know was sin, but I wanted to get right with Jesus. Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He died in obedience. We ought to live in obedience. Now, we've got brothers and sisters around the world that are giving their life. We've not had to do that here yet. It could come our way here in America. But if we're struggling living for him in the comfortable, blessed environment that we have, uh, we probably need to walk up to that brass laver that you've so t taught us about where we can examine ourselves. God, damn, am I really Christian? Am I really sold out to Jesus? Am I following his example? Because here we read, he made himself of no reputation. He didn't have a, a bumper sticker honk if you love me. You know, uh, uh, you know, and I've, I've heard the story that somebody kept blowing at this person that was a Christian and they just went off on them because they were blowing their horn and when they found out what it was when they had the bumper sticker said honk if you love Jesus I thought that's what you wanted me to do <laughs> so they were showing how deep of some Jesus they had um the scripture plainly reveals how utterly Jesus humbled himself by submitting to the will of God um, James 4 6 and 7 tells us first submit to God before there's an effective resistance of the devil or the flesh can be mounted. Let's return to the desert just for a few moments. The Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That means the Father had the Holy Spirit to have Jesus go there. He went in obedience. And he went there being tempted of the devil for 40 days, the Bible says. The Father knew what was going to happen. Uh, Jesus went in obedience and in obedience went to the wilderness of temptation. But there was a submission to the God before there was a resistance of the devil. He was weak in his flesh because he went 40 days without his blazed pizza. He went 40 days without his Dr. Pepper. He went 40 days without his beef brisket burnt ends. Uh, he went 40 days with whatever's your favorite food. Jesus went without water. He went without out his mountain dew and he was tempted of the devil but because he was fully submitted to God first he was able to resist the devil he wasn't depending in his flesh to get him through the temptation in humbling himself and submitting to the will of God by coming to earth as a man he fulfilled the principle of submission before fulfilling the principle of resistance to the devil in his earthly ministry principle of submission then the principle of resistance we can put Satan behind us. We can put him under our feet. The Bible lets us know that's where he belongs. But the only way he can be put behind us, he can be put under our feet. We can be victorious over him is by first submitting to the will of God. Before, his victoriously, he, re before he victoriously resisted the devil in the wilderness... Jesus had already submitted to God through the 40 days of fasting. We've got on our church calendar a revival, and I've been wrestling. I felt like we need to have one, but we don't need to just schedule one to say, hey, we're going to fill space between October 20, that Sunday morning, and the 23rd, that Wednesday night. We just want to fill space and say we, we're going to have a revival to say we had one. Uh, we, we need to get serious about what God is wanting to do in our church and get serious about praying and fasting because I believe where we are, church, is just a launching pad of where God wants to take us in the kingdom of God and, and the victories that he is going to give us. I believe this all, with all my heart, what he promised Joshua, everywhere you step your foot, I'm going to give it to you. We need to start doing some prayer walks, some prayer rides, and just believe God for some territory. Amen. Uh, that's the commercial. I apologize.
<clears throat> following the Jesus model. Again, in the life of Jesus, considering the Gethsemane garden agony of Jesus before his crucifixion. In Matthew 26, 35 through 46, Mark 14, uh, 32 through 42, and in Luke 22, 39 through 46, we see Jesus preparing for the ultimate sacrifice of his own body. He's wrestling in his mind. Um, okay, so he's 100% man and he's 100% God. And I believe in his human body, the Father didn't always show him the, the, the end from the beginning because he was in the flesh. But I believe he still had Holy Spirit discerning with things. I perceive somebody has touched me. And in this instance, I believe he could see what was getting, maybe as a kid, Jesus was taken by Mary and Joseph to a local crucifixion and he saw because it happened all the time by the Romans. They would hang criminals on crosses, and it was a public disgrace. And so the public uh, was often brought out to see, look, this is what's going to happen to you if you violate Roman rule. And no doubt he had that image in his head, and he's in the garden, and he's, this image that we have here, he's laying over the rock. I, I think uh, that movie, The Passion of the Christ, was, was a, a, a great depiction of the, the agony that Jesus was experiencing when he was in the garden and wrestling the devil, tempting him to just get, you know the angels are come and rescue you. Your father really don't want you to suffer like this. The devil playing on every emotion, coming at him at every angle, working against him, uh, Jesus preparing himself ultimately for the sacrifice of his own body, preparing for his own crucifixion. He's in deep, dark sorrow of soul. He travails an agonizing prayer. He goes to his disciples thinking that they're over there holding him up. I got you back, brother. You don't worry about it. When you show back up, we're praying for you. And they, he gets over there and they're all laying on, on roots and in grass and they're all asleep. And he asks the question, can you not? Not just tarry one hour. They weren't even praying like they told him. They were all asleep. And he goes back and he agonizes. And he says this in Mark 14, 36. Father, all things are possible to you. Take away this cup from me. That's the man, Christ Jesus. Take this cup away from me, God. This is heavy stuff. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will be done. That's pretty heavy stuff. Jesus gives us an example. No matter what we're facing, we can go through it if we'll submit to God first. We can make it. Still talking about pulling down the rebellion of the flesh, following Jesus' model. The significance here uh, is that just as surely as Jesus resisted Satan in the wilderness because he had first submitted himself to God during and before the 40-day fast, so also did Jesus resist strong human fleshly yearning for survival without the cross. He was in the garden. Lord, Father, God, let this, let this cup pass from me. But he was irrevocably surrendered to the will of the Father. There, I, there cannot be, I can't tell you that I'm always there perfectly, Sister Ellen. That there's times I want to crawl down off my cross. And I, I want to uh, be the person to defend my rights. I'm an American. And, and, I, and then I, I realize, well, I am, but I'm a Christian. And I'm to, I'm to represent Jesus in this world. And there's times that you... You and I have to hang from our crosses and have the, the whole spirit about us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's got to be tough, but Jesus did it. This is to say that the same submission to God that gives strength to resist the devil will also serve uh, to give believers the strength when they need it uh, to resist their own flesh. The key to the Jesus model is submission to God. Submission to God. I mentioned it Sunday morning, Roosevelt Miller, I will follow thee, dear Lord. We sing the hymn, I Surrender All. A guy named Clay Cross wrote a newer version of the song, I Surrender All, but it's all about laying down my own kingdoms, laying down my own uh, armament that I have built up to protect what's mine and totally, 100%, totally uh, submitting myself to God and surrendering to Him. Indeed, what is needed is a continual submission to God. In Gethsemane, Jesus approached the Father in submission three separate times. 
So, as we continue the thought of pulling down the rebellion of the flesh, following the Jesus model, Christians should remember that the flesh is a living thing. Um, I, I believe it was Judah told me that I think the largest organ is our skin. The largest organ on our body is our epidermis, our skin. And it gets in the way a lot of times of our Christian wall. And... Uh, uh, Sister Vicky over here uh, of small frame, but you let somebody mistreat one of those two babies of hers and she hulks out. I promise you she's going to hulk out and uh, there's going to there's going to be people just laid out everywhere. And that's the same way with every mama in here. There's a supernatural she bear power that comes over a mama and somebody's going to get hurt real bad. If daddies aren't careful, they can get hurt. I'm just saying. <laughs> The flesh is a living thing. It does not want to be placed on the sacrificial altar of consecration to God. Our flesh wants to do its own thing. We want to go our own way. I'm tired of him telling me to raise my hand. I'm not. It should be something I want to do. Yeah, you're right. And so I'm not going to do it because somebody asked me to do it. And I've heard people say stuff like that. Well, if we hadn't already come geared up to worship God, it's, it's going to take more than three 90 mile an hour songs to get me there. This submissive consecration must be an ongoing, continual offering up of our flesh in obedience to God. After we submit, I got to pause, going back to one of Sister Ellen's former teachings about the, uh, the sacrificial altar, that brazen altar. They would take that sacrifice and they would, it, it was already dead, but then they would tie that dead sacrifice to the horns of the altar. They would strap that dead animal down like it was going to get up. But it, it was symbolic of even when we say we've died to sin and we're alive in Jesus, if we don't tie this flesh down to the altar, this thing will rise back up. It'll tell you, hey, you remember when you used to go drink at the bars all the time? You need to go do that some more. You remember when you run around on, on your spouse? Yeah, you need to go do that some more. So, brother, that's a little strong. No, that's what this flesh tries to tell you to do. It tries to get us to return to the old way of living. And we got to have a funeral and and, and put that, that old flesh in that coffin and bury him under the submission uh, on the sacrificial altar of God under submission. The submissive consecration must be an ongoing, continual offering up of our flesh and obedience. After we submit to God with our whole heart, then we can expect to victoriously resist both Satan and the flesh nature. We got Satan that we have to battle, but he's, he's one thing. Jesus defeated Satan uh, with the cross. It's our flesh most of the time. This next point uh, under walking in the spirit, uh, it's real easy uh, for, uh, and I like the way it's put here, we use the charismatics and Pentecostal use, well, the devil made me do it. That's our excuse for saying we have failure in our lives. Uh, it's, it does no good to blame the devil for our sins uh, when our own fleshy desires or lust is the culprit. The Bible lets us know that um, when you have a relationship with lust, when, when you have that relationship, it, it, it conceives and it brings forth what? Sin. And then when sin full grown, sin will murder you. I know I'm paraphrasing the scripture, but it says when, when you have a relationship with lust, sin is conceived, sin is born and is full grown. And when it is, it brings forth death. Is that not how the scripture reads? Lust is the true culprit. This kind of the devil made me do it. Uh, cannot work. So often it is simply our carnal flesh attempting to control our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. The key to victory can be found in submitting ourselves in sanctified consecration to God and also making an ongoing practice of walking in the Spirit. Um, I cherish these moments. They don't happen often, Brother Richard, but when they do, I just let it go. It shocks me, but I keep my shock on the inside. If we're walking in the mall, my 15-year-old daughter, who's now a little taller than me, will take me by the hand and want to hold my hand. And I let her hold my hand because there may be a day that she's too big for her britches and not want to do that no more. And I just let that roll because that's, that's few and far between. I'm thinking, we're going to have revival at church Sunday. <laughs> 
because she wants to hold her daddy's hand. This last part says we must make an ongoing practice of walking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us, and He wants us to take Him by the hand, and not just when we're shopping in the mall, but all the time, that He becomes so familiar to us that we can hear Him whisper in our ear. That's where God wants us to be in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We're still talking about pulling down the rebellion of the flesh. We, we talked about the Jesus model. We're, we're, we're moving into now walking in the Holy Spirit. We're holding hands with Him. When we walk in the Spirit, we are hungry for God and we desire to be like Him. In Galatians 5.25, He says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, and I read this, and I reread this, and, and, and there's more Scripture above and below, but as soon as I read this, this is what I was thinking. If I say, oh, I'm living in the Spirit, then I need to walk it out. If I say with my mouth, I'm going to live in the Spirit, then I need to walk out living in the Spirit. Does that know what that says to you? Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The term walk here, I don't even know if I could say this word. Um, but anyway, it's a Greek word, and it means to march in military rank to keep step. That is, to conform to uh, virtue and piety, to walk orderly, to walk in the Spirit. Then... Uh, then is an act of spiritual warfare against uh, the fleshy nature. Um, the thing that had come to my mind, and, and Brother Gill came to my mind, and he was in the army, and I remember him talking about uh, they would go on marches, and there would be one person, a, a sergeant, or commanding officer, and that commanding officer was marching with them, and he would say out a cadence, and they had to repeat the cadence back. And in my mind, I picture our commanding officer, Jesus Christ, and we said we've enlisted in his army and we're soldiers of the cross and we put on the armor of God and we are marching together because that's what that word means that word means that we are walking you know, we're walking in order in the Holy Spirit. We're, we're following after the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus has given out the orders. And I think the cadence that we hear is the Holy Spirit speaking. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go to the Father. For if I don't go to the Father, the cadence will not come. The Holy Spirit will not come. But when I go, I'm going to pray the Father and he's going to give you another comforter. He will teach you, that's that cadence, all things whatsoever I have committed, committed you. Uh, it's coming out in a minute. Whatsoever I have given you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are soldiers of the cross. Uh, we, we are to listen to the cadence coming from our, our master sergeant, our commanding officer, Jesus Christ, and we are to walk orderly according to that cadence. Now, I've tapped this thing twice, and I've jumped ahead, so if I skip something, and please forgive me. I'm still talking about walking in the Spirit, and I'm on the, the uh, paragraph that says, on the contrary. On the contrary, the one who is not walking in the Spirit is a straggler at best, and at worst, they are a deserter. Um, the word come to my mind, and I think it's absence without leave, AWOL, uh, going AWOL. Nobody told you you could leave uh, base. Nobody told you you could break ranks and, and pull off and do your own thing. Uh, if uh, they, He says, straggler at best and at worst a deserter. A Christian literally cannot fight successful spiritual spiritually if they are walking in the flesh. If we're walking in the flesh, and you know, there's some that say, hey look, once you confessed your, your sins to Jesus, you've accepted Jesus into your heart and you've shaken the hand of a minister, then you don't have to worry about what you do for the rest of your lives because you're A-OK -okay with God. But according to what we're reading here, if we say we live in the Spirit, we need to walk in the Spirit. And we, as we read this, if we keep continually yielding to the works of the flesh, if we keep yielding to our fleshy nature, our fleshy, fleshy nature is going to lead us to to a destructive end, it will lead us away from God. When we have those moments of, of, of spiritual stupidity, I want to call it, and we fail God, 
Do you feel closer to God when you do that? Or do you feel horrible and condemnation and conviction? And why did I say that or do that or go there? The reason being is the Holy Spirit trying to get us back into cadence with what Jesus is speaking to our lives and how we ought to live. The evidence of walking in the Spirit is spiritual fruitfulness. It's amazing that our previous Bible study before we started this uh, fighting the good fight was on the fruit of the Spirit because here we are again. It's coming back up, slapping us right in the face or in the heart. Galatians 5 22. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance and against such there is no law. There's nothing Satan can throw up at us if we are, are fulfilling the fruit of the Spirit allowing it to grow in our lives, Satan doesn't have a combat for that. Christians must actively feed the spirit man with a hearty diet of the Word of God and vibrant prayer that keeps intimate with Jesus and the flow of the Holy Spirit. Pulling down rebellion of the flesh. So here's the, that was the defensive strategy. There are two parts. You remember what the first part of the defensive strategy is? Follow the Jesus model. Let's say that together. Follow the Jesus model. Then the second one is walk in the Spirit. Let's say that. Walk in the Spirit. That's our defensive model. I mean, that's our defensive strategy. Uh, follow the Jesus model and walk in the Spirit. Now, an offensive strategy. Our warfare with the flesh must be every bit as aggressive in nature as our war with Satan. In war, one is faced with a brutal but the apt credo, kill or be killed. Jesus warned us about this in John 10, 10, and he said, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. Satan's whole, uh, they, when he went to God over Job, he, uh, if God hadn't laid it out and said, you can touch anything he's got, but you can't touch his, his soldiers' his life. You can't kill him. But if God hadn't said that, Satan had killed him too. Satan destroyed everything in that man's life. Um, <clears throat> everything. Even his wife had uh, betrayed him, forsaken him. Can you imagine the mental anguish he was experiencing knowing he lost his children? He lost everything he had ever worked for. He, the, 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 the Bible says the thing he feared the most had come upon him. His wife had, had told him just curse God and die. And he was alone sitting in ashes with an ox goad uh, scraping the sores of his body. He was racked with pain. And here he was facing, but by the end of the book, he was still walking with God. So it is with our warfare with the flesh, man. We got to put this thing down. We got to take him down. Our flesh will tell us, you need to do this. It's okay. Because everybody else is. They, the president has made this all right. Congress has said it's okay. And there's things that this country will tell us is okay because we're of certain age now. And because we're of age, we can just, they can card us and that makes it all right. See, I meet the criteria, but do we meet the scriptural criteria of a child of God? Does God want us to participate in these things? Does God want us to be? It's not whether or not the numbers are on our driver's license. It's whether or not we're following what the scripture tells us we are to live. So there's a simple seven point plan taken from the New Testament. At first I thought about seven points and simple probably is an oxymoron. Um, but let's talk about the simple seven point plan. The first, first one is this, and we're talking a little bit Johnston County now or Eastern North Carolina. You need to reckon the flesh is dead. You, you need to reckon the flesh is dead. First, we must reckon it as dead, as Romans 6 and 11 tells us. Dead things are powerless to exert influence or control. You like the scripture talks about in Jesus, um, uh, everything has been made new, but for it says that old things have passed away. We use that phrase when someone has died. Oh, brother so-and-so has passed away. Um we got to kill the flesh. We've got to reckon the flesh is dead. The, Ephesians uh, 4.22 tells us that we need to, to put off the flesh. We need to make sure to put it away. Why wear dirty old garments like the flesh when we have been given a new robe of righteousness uh, from the Lord as a gift? 
uh, old things have passed away. He's given us, I, I like the scripture when he talks about the spirit of the Lord, uh, God is upon me because he has anointed me in Isaiah 61 because it talks about him giving me beauty for the ashes in my life and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So uh, th this question comes to my mind, that which we have, that's which we have. Did you get it from God? Because if what you got, you didn't get it from God, you got the wrong stuff. We need to put it down and get what he's got for us. And what he's got for us is so much greater. So why wear the dirty old garments when we've got a garment of righteousness in Jesus Christ? So put off the flesh. Um, the third one, letter C here, is surrender the flesh to Christ. We must surrender it to Christ as we allow him to live uh, in us, Galatians 2.20. He gave himself for us. Now we're free to give ourselves back to him. Uh, the next one is don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And Galatians 5.16 tells us uh, to make no provision for the flesh. We, we are not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Believers are to walk in the spirit. The flesh has no room to stage a successful takeover attempt if we are in, in the spirit. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If there's something you know is a weakness for you spiritually that would lead you back down the road to sin. Whatever that is, don't make any inclination, any effort. If it's getting rid of your television or your computer or your internet, if you can't, uh, if you can't go to Applebee's or Ruby Tuesdays because they got a bar and you used to go to the bar all the time and get drunk out of your gourd, then you just need to go to Cracker Barrel because they don't have it. You can just drink the little bottles of syrup. <laughs> Find somewhere. Uh, don't make provision for the flesh. If that was a weakness for you, say, well, I'm going to just be strong. I remember when I was at East Coast Bible College, and some guys had gotten kicked out of school. And uh, their testimony, their words sounded, sounded good, um, but they actually were caught by some folks coming out of the local uh, topless bar and said, well, we, we were just in there witnessing. <laughs> right. They made room for the flesh. Crucify the flesh, Galatians 5, 25. We are to crucify the flesh. All of the attitudes, affections, and lust of the flesh should be nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ, who shed his blood uh, to cleanse us from all iniquity. we got to crucify the flesh. Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, what does he have to do first? He must deny himself. Then he's got to take up his cross and follow me. And doing those are not always easy to do. It's not always the comfortable thing to do, but it's the called thing to do for those who say, I am a Christian. The next one is don't put confidence in your flesh. Don't put confidence in your flesh. It's not in this uh, scripture, but the Bible talks of that, that a man needs to take heed lest when he thinks he stands, lest he falls. I believe that those men in the 80s, those great ministries that did crumble, I believe it had to do with God blessed them. They were anointed, but they got too big for their spiritual britches. They got their mind on the money. They got their mind on, look at what I have done for the kingdom of God. And the rug was jerked out from under them. They had confidence in their flesh and they failed. Philippians 3.3 3 says, put no confidence in the flesh. Since we know that the arm of the flesh will fail us, we can now confidently put our trust in Christ alone. We have the capacity to sin. We need to know that. We need to come to grips with, we've got the capacity to sin. I had to ask our former youth director, Rob, Rob Taylor, because he was preaching one time. He said, we've got the propensity to sin. I had to say, okay, thank you for that big word, and I'm going to write it down and remember it. What are you talking about? 
It was the capacity. We have the capabilities of messing up royally because it's in our flesh to do that. That's, we weren't born saved. We weren't born holy and with halos and wings. Uh, we were born with horns and tails and pitchforks. We didn't have to teach our kids to lie to us. We didn't have to teach our kids to steal cookies. We didn't have to teach our kids to pinch their brother or sister. It comes automatically and then tell us they didn't do it because they were born with it. Have no confidence in the flesh. Our flesh is going to let us down. So it's in our faith. So the last one is the three question rule. The three question rule. There's a guy named David Watson and this was adapted from him. It's called How to Win the War. If a child of God questions or doubts about whether something is right or wrong, we need to ask these three questions. And I'm going to get into there um, in just a moment. I'm going to hit those three. But I've got I to gotta insert this. If we're, if we're questioning well, I wonder if I can get by with this. That's probably something we shouldn't do. I wonder if it's okay for me. We probably shouldn't mess with that. You know, if, if we're wanting God in our lives and we want to be upright and wanting to please Him, shouldn't we say, God, how can I be more like you? Should be our questions. What can I do to be more like Jesus? God, how can I be more surrendered to you? How can I trust you more? Not how much can I get by with and still be okay with God? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the first one is, will what I desire uh, to do, will it hinder or help my relationship with Jesus? We talked about it in our series on Faith Fit, that we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which besets us. In works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19, and we're bouncing all over these scriptures, all these sermons and messages and Bible studies. But at the end of all the list of the works of the flesh, he has a little phrase, and I said it the other week, and the like, meaning anything that looks like this, don't do that. If it's looking like it, it's probably headed down the wrong road. So the first one is, will what I desire to do, will it hinder or help my relationship with Jesus? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Then 1 Corinthians 8, 9, will, will it help or hinder? someone else's relationship with Jesus. Cain and Abel, and, the, and Cain said, what do you mean, where is Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? God's like, yes, you are. And, and Paul put it this way, make sure that what we do in our walk with the Lord, that we don't do something that is going to call a weaker brother to stumble. That's what he's talking about, becoming a stumbling block. Will it help or hurt somebody else's relationship? You know, Jesus didn't do what he did for him. He did what he did to please the Father, and he did what he did for us. And we as Christians are to do what we do to please the Father, and we're to do what we do to bless others. Finally, above all, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11, 1, will my actions well, what I'm getting ready to say, will it glorify God? Is God going to get glory out of what I'm getting ready to do? We take these three. I'm going to go back and read them. Is it going to help or hinder my relationship? Is it going to help or hinder somebody else's relationship with God? And number three, is God going to get glory out of my actions? Uh, Brother Mike quoted it back to me this week. My, my actions, words, deeds, it was like four or five or six. But what we do reveals what we believe about God. And if we say we're a Christ and I believe he saved me, then we got to live the saved life, the glorified, sanctified life, because that's what a Christian is supposed to do. Still talking about that offensive strategy, the three-question rule as we continue talking about that. While the power of the flesh is challenging, I don't want to take away from that. We struggle. One of the precious aspects, I don't, I don't understand, I'm just, I'm just be transparent with you guys. After Sunday, uh, preaching on Mondays, it's been almost like every Monday since I've been called into ministry. Mondays like drag my backside, almost want to just throw in the towel. I don't know what it is about Mondays. I think uh, we've been in church, we've been worshiping, we've expended ourselves in giving ourselves to God and Monday rolls around. Or maybe that's the way it is for everybody. But I know sometimes Mondays are, are hard and long and it seems like a spiritual battle and I long for Tuesday because it's like Monday will be behind me. Is anybody else? Uh, who was it talked about rainy days and Mondays always get me down? 
when the power of the flesh can be challenged, one of the precious aspects of our salvation is its ability to break the very power of sin. Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but you are under grace. We're under grace. There's a song, and I, I, hopefully we can learn it as the, as the, the praise team. Uh, I think for King and Country, sing it, but it's called Flawless. Uh, is the name of the song, but the song is about uh, is about grace, and it gets to a point in the song. It says, uh, "Grace, grace, God's grace," and I remember the older song that talked about that. It is we're walking under grace. Paul declares in Galatians five twenty four, "They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and its lust." If a besetting sin plagues a believer, we need to submit it immediately to the power of Jesus Christ that is already within us. According to God's Word, you do not have to be forced to sin. We said it earlier, the devil made me do it, don't work for a Christian because he has no authority. Our flesh has no authority. We yield authority to it. Through Christ, the believer has genuine victory. I've got 827. Uh, we could start into the power of intercession in chapter 6. I don't think we've got enough time to really get into that. I think it will break up the flow of that specific chapter. So I'm not going to start there. Uh, so we're going to stay in and be dismissed. Um, I, I hope that these studies are, are, are helping you. Um, and here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Uh, and, and Sister Ellen, I'm volunteering you real quick to do this. Not just tonight, but if you have a study that's been on your mind, something you'd like to see brought, maybe just come by Sister Ellen and say, hey, would you write this down and maybe you and Brother J.D. and whoever else wants to help teach on Wednesday nights that it may be at future reference we can actually do a study on and we'll try to do what we can to work that in on Wednesday nights. How's that sound? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your power, your grace and mercy, your love. Lord, for the power of your strength. Thank you for Jesus' model, for the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we can walk in the Holy Spirit. And thank you for this seventh step uh, offensive against the flesh. We have victory. We give praise and honor to you, Lord. Keep us by your power and grace, I humbly pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Hey, Zach, would you go press that button? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. One of the young...